asked uh, Craig Bledsoe to come up and uh, pray over our president before he speaks. Uh, you are what you are when no one else is around. And great leaders are people you follow when you don't have to. Randy and I were taking a car ride to Chattanooga for a little event. We went down there and came back, and those are always interesting car rides because he is my friend, but you always know you're also riding with your boss, and uh, you know there's going to be some work involved at the other end. And in the reality of just two guys in a car having fun and talking and doing different things and just hanging out. I got to see what I see a lot, but I got to see a glimpse of his heart because he talked about the thing that uh, he really feels very strongly about. You could judge the success of this institution with a lot of external measures that would blow people's minds, and there are a lot of really neat metrics that are out there that talk about all the growth of the institution and all the things that you like to talk about. But he said to me when we were riding in that car, he said, you know, I love all the good things we're doing, and I love, I love that we're going out and doing mission work and all those things and that we send kids all over the world. But he said, the thing that I really think about is the 4,000-plus people that God sends to us every year. And are we being faithful to that? And we started talking about what does it look like to really be faithful to this stewardship, to be faithful to you for us to do our jobs at a Christian institution. And where we landed, he said, you know, I don't think we've done our jobs if we don't ever really present Jesus to our students and give them a moment, give our students a moment to decide for themselves, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with this question we've been talking about all week? Because he's either Lord or he's not. He's either the Son of God or He's not. And if He is, it means everything. And so we started talking about what it would look like and really this whole year's Kingdom is Near theme grew out of that conversation and this Resurrection Week where we grapple with this question grows out of that conversation. But I, I want to tell you right now that what I'm convinced of is that we're on holy ground for this reason. The guy who's the boss is about to do his job. And Craig's going to come pray over. Father, we are um, on holy ground this morning. We feel your presence here, and we're so grateful for that presence. We're so grateful that you are in our lives every day, uh, that you're here with us at this moment. Father, I want to thank you for um, Randy Lowry and for Rhonda Lowry. I want to thank you for their love um, for this school, their heart for this place, their love for the students here. But Father, I especially want to thank you for their heart for you, their love for you. Um, I've seen it firsthand. I've witnessed it. Um, I've been the, the recipient of that love that, that they show your love through them. And I just pray this morning uh, that you will be with Randy, that your Holy Spirit will fill him, and that he will speak the words you want him to speak. And we know that that will be true. And Father, I pray that you will open our ears and our lives to your call. We're so grateful for the gift of that call, for the gift of your son, and it's through his name we pray. Amen. It was some weeks before that car ride with Scott that I woke up early one morning and, well, it was a bit of a nightmare. I woke up and I wasn't worried about balancing the $130 million budget. I wasn't worried that morning about you on a mission trip traveling all over the world and being safe and being protected. I wasn't worried about the next Division I win. I wasn't worried about most of the things that a president sometimes worries about. But I did wake up that morning worried about something. 
worried that together 5,000 of us, 4,200 students and 700 faculty and staff, almost 5,000 of us would labor here to build a really great university. And in doing all of that, we would fail to ask the most important question in the world. And we can get pretty distracted with that. Oh, I envision the campus doubling in size and going all the way to Grandview. And in your time here or shortly thereafter, that will happen. I can envision that, that we could add another 40 academic programs and hire another 100 faculty. I can envision that somehow, miraculously, next year we'd have all the parking you would need, and if we didn't have the parking, we'd offer a valet service for you. I can envision that. I can envision that we will continue to work hard and attract students from all over the world to the campus. I can envision that just like our College of Education was named number one this year in the state of Tennessee, program after program after program will have that acclamation. I can envision that because we got Starbucks, we could also get a Waffle House. Wouldn't that be cool? And late at night, you wouldn't have to drive to Trousdale or wherever that one is and sit there. We'd have it on campus. I can envision that. I can envision that our Division I athletic program will continue to mature. It'll take about five more years till it's fully there. But I can envision that every year we will beat Belmont at Belmont. I can envision that. That's possible. And the vision goes on and on because we're at work doing some really, really significant stuff. And you are as much a part of that as students, as these faculty and staff are. And together we've been caught up in this mission. And the mission is something that is very, very special. And the world is taking notice that something very special is happening here. But if all those things happen, and if all those things happen and we fail to ask what is the most important question that can be asked, I'm not sure my tenure would be worth writing about in a history book, or your time here would be very memorable. You know, Jesus was a guy who asked questions. Jesus was someone who asked questions many times instead of giving answers. In fact, Someone had a slow day, I guess, and sat down and read through the entire New Testament to figure out how many questions Jesus asked. And just in case you're interested, the number is 307. I haven't checked. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Uh, but I've read enough of them to get a sense that that could be accurate, that Jesus all the time was asking questions, and in the asking of those questions, leading us to a relationship with our Father. Oh, early in his ministry, he would ask the question, what is life? Is it not more than food and the body more than clothes? Or late in his life, he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And along the way, during his ministry, a great deal more. There was one moment recorded in the 16th chapter of Matthew. Jesus has been about his ministry and has been kind of hectic and kind of intense and a lot's been going on. He's been telling stories right and left. He's been healing people and performing miracles. He has now by this time really hacked off the religious leaders of his day. And he finds himself in a quiet moment alone with his closest followers, his disciples. And he asks two questions of them. The first one kind of checks in as he says, who do people say that I am? Now, I don't really think Jesus was all that concerned about how people thought of him. He was not like the former mayor of New York who would go around and just say, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing all the time? He was not particularly concerned from a public relations standpoint. He was really wondering if they understood who he was. And in the answer, real quickly, we recognize they didn't. Some said, oh, the rumor is out that you might be John the Baptist. Others are saying maybe Elijah. Oh, some others think you might be Jeremiah. Others think you're one of the prophets. 
And so there's this sense of confusion as the people closest to him don't yet understand. This play is not being walked out like they anticipated. And then he turns and he asks the central question for all time. He says, and, and how about you? How about you? How about you? Who do you say that I am? In looking at that passage from the 16th chapter of Matthew, I know I can't do this as well as your Bible faculty. Oh, we have people that are trained in theology and have done all the work to understand this passage far better than I ever will. And, and frankly, they probably can preach it far better than I could be in that kind of role. And, and this morning, I acknowledge quickly that I'm not a preacher. I'm a lawyer, and so I, I'm not gifted that way. And so I'm, I'm not going to try to be something I'm not. And for the next very few minutes... I want to even not be your president. Oh, I don't know how I walk away from it. I probably can't get away from it. Uh, I, I've got to walk the roll out. But for a few minutes, would you give me the freedom to, to not be your president, but to be Randy? To be someone who walks the journey with you? To be someone that sometimes has his life in order and sometimes really doesn't? Would you give me permission to share with you from my heart not what is probably tremendously sophisticated or, or something that's particularly academic but would you allow me to share from my heart my hope for you I hope I hope that during this experience at this wonderful university, however you came for whatever reason from wherever, I hope that during your experience here, you will find a radical Jesus that elevates values over behavior. Unpack that just for a second. A radical Jesus, that word is carefully chosen. It's not a word that makes a lot of church people very comfortable. But I hope you find in all of your study, in all of your conversation, in all your experience, in all your ministry here, a Jesus who was radical because he valued something. Well, behavior was important. We're all called to have a sense of character. We're called to walk this out. But Jesus seemed to say, even more important than that are some values that stand behind it. And when he began to lay it out, it was radical for his people and ours as well. He said, you know, you've heard you're not supposed to murder people, and most of us deal with that pretty well. He says, but let me tell you what you're supposed to not do. You're not supposed to even be angry. Really? He said, oh, you know, it's against the law. You're not supposed to commit adultery. You're supposed to honor uh, sexuality and marriage and all of those things. God has blessed them and you are to respect them. But here's what I say. It's not just the technical part of that. You ought not even lust. You ought not even think about how you might violate your covenant, your promises, your relationships. He says, oh, you've heard, you know, the eye for an eye thing? Yeah, and that's pretty easy for us to respond that way. You hurt me and I'll hurt you. But he says, no, no, no. In my world, in my kingdom, it's different than that. I want you to think about how when your eye is plucked out, you turn the other cheek. Or that, that love stuff, you know, you're supposed to love your neighbor. Yeah, we kind of get that down. He says, no, no, you're not supposed to just love your neighbor. You're supposed to love your enemy. What does that really mean? Jesus was radical. So radical that he was crucified. He hacked people off at such a level and at such depth that they literally hung him on a cross and in 48 hours, 
in the Azell Chapel, maybe Collins Auditorium, we will celebrate in a very somber moment that moment of history. And as we remember that moment, we will anticipate on Sunday morning the sense of resurrection and the completion of the story. I wonder if my life is such. I wonder if my life is such that anyone would think about crucifying me because I was that different. David McCulloch has said in a book, The Trivialization of God, he said, you know what we've done is we've taken God and we have transformed God so he's the God we want to have. And he said, along the way, we've lost something. We've lost the God and the reflection of God in, in his son that was. In fact, he says, the worst sin of the 20th century is that we exchanged a radical savior for a respected religious figure. We exchange a radical savior for a respected religious figure. I don't know how it will happen, and I don't know where it will happen, but I hope that somewhere along this path and this journey together, you discover a radical Jesus. I also hope that you will discover a Jesus who was relational. You know, he had this ability to kind of elevate relationships over even religion. And again, it bothered people because they struggled with it because that's just not what it was all set out to be. But in his priority, in his interaction, in his working with people over and over again, we see that there was something there that left religion behind because the relationship was so important to him. A number of you will walk away from all this, at least statistically. Lifeway says that if you grew up in an evangelical home, 70% chance you won't be a part of any religion by the age of 23. Now, that's probably different for Lipscomb students, different for those who choose a Christian college, different for those who have a sense of faith and want to express it. So, so I don't think that statistic would apply in this audience. But the reality is there's something that causes generation after generation to say, I looked at that and, well, it's just not all that significant to me. And my sense is it may be like John Smith has said, we gave you facts, but we didn't give you faith. We gave you relationship, but we didn't give you, we gave you religion, but not relationship. We gave you church, which was wonderful, but we didn't give you Christ. And because you got one list and never saw the other one, it doesn't have much meaning or significance. But Jesus, over and over again, he made a different choice. Well, there it is, John the chapter 8 we have this story about those who were the religious leaders bringing to Jesus a woman who had been caught in adultery. We know what the law says. We know what the rules are. The rules are that we are to stone her. Now, I want you to think about it in a realistic way. There she is on the ground in front of all those that are accusing her. And in a few moments, if we walk this out as the Jewish law would recommend... We literally will look around and pick up stones and we will throw them at her until she's injured and bleeding and finally dead. That's the penalty. And they're trying to trick him. They're trying to put him in a box. What's Jesus going to do now? How's he going to get out of this bind? Oh, and he responds in that amazing way. We don't know what he wrote on the ground, but we do know he said, let everyone that is without sin cast the first stone. And slowly those who looked inside themselves begin to back up and disappear into the larger crowd because they knew they had been convicted. And wouldn't you like to have been there then when they're all gone and Jesus is here with a woman who is inherently sinful? And he looks at her and well, he asked another question. Where are those who accuse you? 
She looks around and says they're gone. And he says, neither do I go and sin no more. It wasn't that he didn't have a standard. It wasn't that he accepted sin. But it was a sense that Jesus said, there's an order here, and the order is I'm going to accept you, and I'm going to love you, uh, and I'm going to express the graciousness of God to you, and then I hope you will live the life God calls you to live. I've been president for seven years. Never, frankly, have I been as nervous as I was a couple of weeks ago when Soul Force was on its way to Lipscomb. It's hard in those moments where you don't control everything and you haven't had the experience before and here's the notice that uh, a gay, lesbian, transgendered group that want to advocate for the rights of uh, that constituency were going to visit our campus and we had some choices. We could have been like Notre Dame and said, if you step foot on the Lipscomb campus, we will arrest you and that would be the headline in the Tennessee in the next morning. We could have tried to do like that school in Georgia did and lock the gates shut so they couldn't come on campus. But I couldn't find the gates. Uh, there just aren't very many around. That didn't seem like a viable option. And so in the nervousness of the moment, I had the proudest moment. When you as a community welcomed them to our campus. When 18 of you met them at the bus and welcomed them uh, and the administration from Treveca joined us and we had dinner and we had conversation and conversation all the next morning. And when their bus driver was ready to leave, he told Scott this. He said, I've been driving the bus for the last five years across the country. And never, never have we gone to a school as gracious as Lipscomb University. That makes me proud. That makes me proud because it suggests to me you get it. You understand the Jesus we talk about, the relational Jesus who may not approve of the behavior and won't back down from calling people to live a righteous life, but a Jesus who says relationships, the graciousness of a relationship is even more important. Finally, it seems to me as I think about Jesus, I hope you find a relevant Jesus that demonstrates not a sense of isolation, but a sense of engagement. Every year, Ron and I go to Vermont. I teach at Vermont Law School, and during that Vermont trip every year, we go to a small town called Weston, and we go to Weston to a Catholic priory where there now are about 13 remaining monks. And we drive up there and get there in time for evening prayers. We sit in the small, quiet chapel, and pretty soon the door will open and a monk will come out and light a candle. And then a few minutes later, several more monks will come out. And when the whole crowd is there, it's only 13. And they've been doing the same thing over and over again for hundreds of years. And, and I, I have great, great sense of attraction to it, but I don't know how to get there. I, I read the brochure every year that says, even if you're an old guy, you can come for a while. And I say to Rhonda, maybe a week or two, could I, could I go to the priory? And she says, you'll never do it. You'll never be able to do it. You can't sit still long enough. You can't pray five times a day. You, you can't do that. And I say, but, I, but I'm attracted to it. And then I'm reminded that my place is not in a priory. My place is in the world. And your place is probably not in the priory. Your place is in the world. And so all of a sudden we see hundreds of you that go on a spring break mission trip or more of you that will go this summer literally around the world saying, it's not my job to stay here and pray on this campus. It's my job literally to infect the world with the Jesus I follow and the ministry that he called us to. And I'm so excited. And hundreds others of you that participate in SALT and all of our service learning and go to 170 organizations in Nashville and say, here I am trying to be Jesus to the people you serve. Use me. Use me. And example after example after example. 
And even last week, those of you who came and said, we need to talk about racism. Some things happened on the campus that aren't very nice. We need to talk and remind ourselves that the issue is not dead. We need to be in conversation, and we need the university to be a part of it. Or another group of you that said, we're concerned about the homeless. We don't like the new law that was passed in Tennessee, and we're willing to go down and sacrifice some of our own civil liberties in order to protect theirs. You get it. You get a Jesus that said, it's not about being isolated. It's about being engaged it's about being relevant to the world around us. And so here's the last thing that I hope. I hope you find the Jesus that is radical. I hope you find the Jesus that is relational. I hope you find the Jesus that is relevant. And I hope you answer his question. Who am I? Who do you Say that I am. I don't know who's here this morning. And I don't know that I can put you all in a category, but I would guess there are a group of people here that look back on a moment where you said, this is the time in my life that I want the inner cleansing of baptism and I want the symbol to my friends and my family of my decision to follow Jesus. And you remember that moment. It might have been here at Impact in a funny swimming pool out on the south side of the arena. It might have been a church camp somewhere. It might have been at church. It might have been in a very private moment on a beach somewhere. But there are hundreds of you that at some point in your life have said, I want to answer the question, and for me, Jesus is the Son of the living God. I would guess there are others here who frankly have rejected him. That somehow in the, the, the process of life, you've come to this point, and you've said, yeah, I know I'm at Lipscomb, and I know they share this story, and I know they want me to see my part in it, but frankly, I just don't. And frankly, I don't really need religion, and I don't really need that help. I can handle life by myself. And so at least at 21 or 22 or 23, you're going to attempt to do that. And you're going to be confident enough in your own set of skills and your own education and your own preparation that whatever life throws at you during life and whatever happens after life, you can handle and I would hope for you great success. But most of us that have lived a bit longer have realized there are those moments that are beyond us. And it's in those moments we reach down for something and hope to God that it's there. There are probably some of you that are simply avoiding the whole thing you're on your iPhones right now. Yeah, you're texting somebody who's a long ways away, and your idea is, look, there's someone else speaking up there, and every time someone speaks and they indict me just a little bit or it touches my soul or I feel God stirring, maybe I can just check my email and that will distract me enough. I just don't have to make a decision today. Some of you are probably in that category. And some of you probably are in a category of saying, well, you know, I, I believe that's not a problem. I believe there was a God and there was a creation and there was the incarnation of his son and he came and he lived and he died. Yeah, I get all that. But you just haven't gotten to the point where you've surrendered very much to embrace it. And, and so today you're thinking and listening to the stirring inside and wondering if you should respond now or, or perhaps sometime later. I can't make anybody do anything. I'm the president and I have a certain amount of power, but I can't make you do anything. 
but I can make sure that during this administration, during this time in Lipscomb University's history, we at least have asked the question, who do you say that he is? Jesus wants you to answer that question, and Jesus has promised if you will confess him, he will confess you before the God in heaven. Jesus has promised if you will follow his example in baptism and if you will follow his teaching about baptism and if you will follow virtually every single commitment we know of in the New Testament in baptism, if you will do that, he will bring to you new life. Because see, the symbolism, whether it's in a horse trough or it's in the Pacific Ocean, or it's in a formal, ornate baptistry in a church, the symbolism is so clear. Jesus died and was buried and rose again, and so we reenact that as an expression of our inner cleansing and as an expression and a message to our friends and our family and the world where our faith really is. And what an amazing time to think about doing that a few days before Easter. We'll celebrate on Sunday new life. Will you share in new life? We'll listen to three of your classmates as they talk about their new lives. But one day it, it just hit me, he just spoke to me like, you have to be willing to give it all to me. You have to be willing to lay down your entire life for me. So um, um, through that, I realized it, it was time for me to be water baptized and, uh, because I, I was dying to my old life. I, I was dying to, to my sinful nature, um, and I was being made new in Christ. And uh, just ever since that moment, I've, I've just been on fire for God. Uh, no longer live with shame from the past. And, and just so hopeful and, and uh, excited for the future. I think one one day I just completely like broke down and I was just like I like I give up you know I can't do it, and so I just said God like whatever you want to do just I, you know I, mm -hmm. I you know I accept I I can't do anything, and so it was just kind of at that point where I just completely thought you know I want to you know. I wanted to turn my life to God, and and then it was weird. I was in the shower one day, <laughs> just listening to music, and uh, um, it just hit me like I hadn't thought about baptism. I hadn't thought about anything at all, really, even with all that, and um, never in my mind, you know, hadn't ever thought about it really. The only time I ever, you know, thought about it was when people were, you know, I'd be in church when I was younger and saw people getting baptized, and all of a sudden it just came over me, and I thought, <clears throat> like my entire mind was just clear, and it was just like. I want to be baptized hmm. and it was just like a feeling you know it's, there's no way to describe it other than it's just I feel like you know God was really saving me or it's just you know I felt the spirit and I, I thought I want to be baptized I'm different I chose to go after what I believe in not because what everybody else told me this is how you should be you know mm -hmm. so my goal is that maybe I'll inspire another Middle Eastern woman to stand up and mm. believe fight for what they believe in and build that close relationship with God because I think it's really important. You just, you need that really close relationship and I think he'll always take care of you because he's always taking care of me. So that's my story. Jesus, the one who saves me is, you know, the one who gives me hope and the one that shows me how I can live my life, but helps me do it in the process. Oh, so you're the son of God, you're Christ. Yeah. And I believe that strongly. I just know it. <laughs> in just a moment, we're going to do something a little different in chapel. I haven't seen it done at Lipscomb very often. If you've got a 12 o'clock class, I'll be a president for just a second and say, you have my permission to be late, especially for this moment. We want to pause for just a moment. We want to sing a song together. And I want to be a little bit more overt and invite you to come. We're going to sing a song, and I'm going to tell you about the song before we sing it. 
but I'm going to invite you to come. I'm going to invite you this morning to say, yeah, thinking back about all of it, uh, I need to answer the question more boldly, and I may have made a commitment at some point in my life. I want to make a more visible commitment now. You may have been baptized. That's fine. Come forward and let's pray, and, and let's make another commitment. And if you've never been baptized, just like the Yellow Ribbon Soldier last night, and just like the student we saw a moment ago the night before, we got a horse trough set up in Bison Square. Well, see, maybe Jesus understood that to follow him, we have to be humble. And there's a certain amount of humility getting wet in front of a lot of other people. But I never will forget the night at Pepperdine where my roommate, Craig, said, Randy, I don't know anything about church. I've been here at Pepperdine. I've studied. I, I really want to be baptized. And 70 of us went down to the Pacific Ocean, and his life was changed forever. I'll never forget the night. And I want to make sure, as long as I have any power to do anything here, you feel that gracious and loving invitation. And so in a moment, we're going to sing some words. Some of you won't be able to sing them because you can't commit to them. But most of you will be able to sing them, and some of you today will want to do things to sing them the rest of your life. Oh, the author of the song, the words were written by a guy who lived about the time of David Lipscomb, the mid-1800s to the early 1900s. He actually got a degree in art and was an art teacher and struggling, but, but thinking that God had called him to be a great artist and he was working so hard at it. And he talks about 1891 or so, he began to struggle five years in the wilderness trying to resist what God was really calling him to do. 1891 was the year our own school was started. And for five years he struggled, and then finally he decided, you know, I I've got to do what God calls me to do. And so he gave up art in order to go into the ministry, and it was in the ministry that he did something artistic that literally has been around now for decades, affecting the lives of people. He described it this way, At last the pivotal hour in my life came, and I surrendered all. A new day was ushered into my life. I discovered deep down in my soul a talent unknown to me. God had hidden the song in my heart. He caused me to sing songs I had never sung before. And so these are his words. They will be our words this morning. And as we sing them, I'm going to invite our faculty and staff to spread out in the front of Allen Arena here and be praying for you. And I'm going to invite you to come join them and share with them the journey you're on and the journey you want to be on. And if we can embrace that and support you and share with you the moment of conviction or the moment of baptism. Today, we want to do that. So hear these words, and then the praise team will lead us. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. All to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior wholly thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. All to Jesus, Lord, I give myself to thee, Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. Would you stand as together we sing?